Welcome to Massey Dialogues. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers and I'm the principal of Massey College. Massey College is the place where people and ideas intersect and its mission is to nourish learning and serve the public good. Le Collège Massey, Massey in its physical form, is located on indigenous land, the land of the Yorunwanda, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And we want to acknowledge it, acknowledge the stewardship of the land and our great privilege to be here to continue to do our work. The Massey Dialogues have been based on the idea that to serve the public good, we need to build bridges between generations, but also to talk about the really important subject of our days. And today we're going to discuss about a Canadian history of anti-Black racism. And I'm so happy to have with me three fabulous women, young women, I'm the old one here, and uh, they are all going to uh, share their perspective as we begin February, the Black History Month. Elle Jones is our uh, guest today. She's a spoken word poet. She's an educator, a journalist, a community activist who lives in African Nova Scotia. She was the fifth poet laureate in Halifax, and she was the recipient of the Burley Rocky Jones Human Rights Award for her community work, particularly her work on prison justice. Indeed, uh, she's the co-founder of Black Power Hour, which is a radio show for incarcerated people. She's the winner of two Atlantic Journalism Gold Awards in 2018 and 19, her work of spoken poetry live from African resistance was published in 2014. And we're so happy to have her with us today. We've just been watching your work and really are grateful that you're here with us. Thank Nicole, you so much uh, oh, it's wonderful. And you will be uh, joined by two junior fellows, one from the medical school and one from the law school. So Nicole and for McCarthy is a first year medical student at University of Toronto. Prior to medicine, she completed a Bachelor of Health Sciences, uh, Health Sciences at University of Calgary in 2020. While she was at uh, U of C, she completed a thesis on gender at work and the factors and practices that impact employees' experiences with mental health. She's a recipient of the National Terry Fox Humanitarian Scholarship and the 2019 Sheila O'Brien Award for Excellence in Leadership. As I, as I said, she's a junior fellow at Massey College. Lashanti Henry is a first year law student at U of T and she's also a junior fellow at Massey College. Prior to law school, she completed both uh, back in commerce and an MBA from Laurentian University. And while she was there, she was the captain of the women's varsity basketball team. And she volunteers in many organization laws, the law of inactions within schools. And she's the associate editor of the Journal of Law and Equality and a working group member of the International Human Rights Program. Welcome. It's so wonderful to have all three of you. Let me start with Professor Jones. Um, you're teaching journalism. And I just want to know, how does your class engage with issues of racism? Has it been difficult? Um, so I think the first thing is, if we talk about journalism, Obviously, we know the absence of Black people in general, uh, working as reporters, as journalists. And then beyond that, the ways that the work that we do do is marginalized or denied. So um, there's many people that will contest whether I'm a journalist or not. Um, most of my work gets put into opinion writing, which is seen as a lesser mm -hmm. space than reporting, for example. Um, so even though I have reported on a lot of stories, primarily stuff to do with prison, state violence, obviously issues in the Black community, um, that's so frequently delegitimized and people, you know, reduce you to opinion writing, which is just ranting. Um, so I think we also have to talk about, um, before we even talk about Black people teaching journalism, what we learn in journalism, we have to go back to the basic ideas embedded in journalism, such as that it can be objective, uh, such as mm -hmm that, um, you know, what is an opinion, what is reasonable, is all defined by a white majority public. Um, so the kind of language we use, the kind of reporting and work we do is not even seen as intellectual work or as journalism work. So I wanna say that first. Um, and then if I move into the classroom space, how do we deal with race? I teach opinion writing, which is 
obviously, again, it's a different space than reporting, which is seen as the, the more prestigious, the more objective, the more real part of working. Um, whereas opinion writing is, is seen as, well, anyone can have an opinion. But it is the space where we do a lot of work. Um, so before we even begin writing, as what, the main thing I do with the students is start to challenge uh, these basic ideas. So what is objectivity? Uh, what is an opinion? Who decides when an opinion is, is settled? Uh, what becomes a popular opinion? What if our opinion is wrong? If we look back through history, we can look at mm -hmm. and the kind of consequences they paid. So we can look at how black journalists had to intervene into these fields. So we talk mm -hmm. a lot about, um, we talk about how public opinion shifts and changes itself in response to, um, so the reporting on Black Lives Matter in 2016 looks very different from the reporting in 2021 yeah. um, because people mm -hmm. shifted the goal how they wanted to engage with us, right? So we, we do a lot of that work um, and even thinking about language itself, how language is charged, how language in Dion Brand's word is never neutral um, in the phrase that she used, no language is neutral, right? Um, how every choice we make as writers and thinkers is always um, infused with our race, with our yeah. class position, with yeah. our gender. So yeah, that's all the things that we address. Wow, that sounds like a fascinating class. I, and you are in, Af in, in what you describe as African Nova Scotia, and we know what it means, but I think uh, for the, the, the general public out here, why is it important to label it, to say it? You know, Do you think it's been just, because for so many years, we've just avoided talking about this subject? Yeah, I mean, part of the erasure of black presence in Canada, which is, you know, the long erasure, whether from our history, whether from the ways laws have been made to try to discipline and contain us, whether that's immigration laws, obviously that until the 1960s explicitly excluded non-white people from Canada. Um, when we asked, you know, why didn't so many black people come up from the, the South Southern states? Cause we stopped them, right? Like, so mm -hmm. patterns of migration that are defined by this. Um, obviously our contributions to basic Canadian history that's erased. And Nova Scotia is obviously part of that because the longest black presence in North America mm -hmm. is in fact in Nova Scotia. The first black person to land in the, uh, in North America is Matthew DeCosta in 1603, mm -hmm. um, who's translating for uh, this like Portuguese mission with the Mi'kmaq, which is also the question of like, how did he speak Mi'kmaq? So another question people often raise around this narrative of contact. But the first race riots in North America uh, take place in Nova yeah. Scotia, in Georgetown. Um, something people don't know about where the white residents burned out the black loyalist residents for 10 days rioted, um, beginning with their riots against uh, preacher David George, who was condemned for you know not just preaching to black people. So we have this long history that we can then trace through um, how many black people in Canada initially came through African Nova Scotia that we don't remember. So if you talk to people that were in the 50s that wanted to take nursing or education, many black people came out here because that was the only places where those schools were accepting um, black women in particular, right? So until the 1960s when the immigration patterns changed, we changed the point system in places like Toronto start to be the center of black Canada. Africa, Nova Scotia was the center of black Canada for a long time. Yeah. Something that's been forgotten. We can talk about the community of Africville and how Africville was bulldozed yeah. and quite easily erased off the landscape and then all the history and stories that go with that. So um, that's not to claim any particular, like I'm not doing a longevity thing here where I'm saying, African Nova Scotians matter more than a recent immigrant. Um, what I'm saying is that uh, part of the ongoing project of erasing and denying black presence also is directed towards erasing the entire history of this province and our contributions um, to history and also all the ways that segregation existed, all the ways that black life was destroyed, all the ways that violence has been uh, directed towards us. These are some of the communities where the longest history of experiencing white supremacy exists as well, right? So um, I think, it's extremely important. I mean, I always encourage all black Canadians to make your pilgrimage to Africa, Nova Scotia and experience the communities out here. And um, the I think what is a unique uh, form of blackness. So that's again, not a value judgment to say that this is better than that. It's just to say that there is a unique yeah. identity of black people in this province that has been so long denied and erased. And it's so important in not just the history of black Canada, but the history of so-called Canada period. And of course, I pause here to say this is Mi'kmaq territory, unceded, unsurrendered Mi'kmaq territory governed by the treaties of 1752. Um, you know, we know that Cornwallis, for example, directed scalping proclamations towards Mi'kmaq women and children as a deliberate um, move of genocide. And I want to acknowledge obviously that black presence in these territories obviously takes place in the context that this is Mi'kmaq first. Um, but our long history here also defines something about black presence. 
I was so happy that you are able to join us. Uh, and and I think it was important to have uh, a voice from Nova Scotia uh, speaking about uh, this uh, as we begin this this month long uh, journey and trying to explore more of the Black history of, of Canada, <laughs> because we tend to think that oh yeah, U.S. But we we always forget, often forget the the long history. In, in Canada. So let me bring on uh, Nicole. Nicole, uh, here you are. So it's the beginning of a Black History Month. What what do you hope will happen this, this month, this year? I mean, it's a special month in a way because it, it comes after so much uh, news reporting, so much, I, I would say, conscientization, you know, that there's a real uh, impetus to, to talk about this issue. So what are your hopes? to accomplish this year. No, yeah, absolutely. Um, I do definitely agree that with COVID um, and the small race-based data that we have been collecting, we have been seeing a lot of disparities and inequities between how people were experiencing the virus. Um, and I think that mm -hmm. definitely brought out calls about anti-Black racism yeah. in Canada. Um, and I think that mm -hmm. in the beginning, we've had discussions and I think we've somewhat acknowledged the presence of anti-Black racism, but I really hope for this February that we recognize its positionality in our institutions and recognizing that anti-Black racism stems beyond individual actions, but actually how we have constructed our society, how we have placed who has access and who doesn't have access stem from the violence of anti-Black racism and its, its, its interconnectedness with our capitalistic society and what we believe to be valuable and important. And is being a, a medical student does that bring a different uh, assessment of the impact of anti-Black racism? I mean, I we know that the, the health impacts have, be, have been uh, tremendous here. Is that where you want to be? Is that what you're hoping to, uh, to do in your career? Uh, I read in your CV that you were interested in health inequities. Uh, <laughs> is, <laughs> And, and or everybody should, but I, I, that was a particular interest of you. So what's, how, what, how, what's your reflection on, on what's happening now? Yeah, no, I think medicine historically has been able to safeguard its reputation from racism by virtue of claiming that they operate solely on objectivity and science. So through that mm -hmm. lens, medicine was able to separate itself from the bias that we associate with racism. But now we really do see that given that racism is a social ill, it, medicine is not protected from it. And, and we do see the elements on both the individual level and social level in terms of how people are treated, um, potentially on a level of physician bias, but also who gets access to healthcare and what does that look like? And how do we engage with disparities? Um, <clears throat> There are definitely discussions about when we do see race-based data, where is this continuous decision that we associate all disparities with genetics? And why do we have to sometimes take a pause or hint before we think, ooh, maybe it's a social, there's a social connection here. But frankly, to protect and to safeguard medicine's reputation, when we do see disparities, we assume that there must be some grand genetic factor, which may be the case. But in a lot of ways, we see that people are people exist in the society that is unequal. So it is not unlikely that they will then receive unequal treatment in the medical system. And in a way, I mean, it makes it that much more richer a study if we're looking a little bit beyond this veneer of uh, everything can be explained by physical aspect, as mm -hmm. opposed to what we know for a long time, social determinants of health have a big impact on, on what's the future. So that's, so first year though, first year COVID and <laughs> this reflections, are you are you hopeful uh, for what can be accomplished within the next uh, few years? Oh no, absolutely. Um, I think mm -hmm. that that's something that I've learned very much over the years is that the idea of joy for me, um, it's radical. And that does mean that we have to be hopeful and that we work with this hope and this is the hope that propels us to do what we do. Um, so I am absolutely helpful. I'm so excited to be in the city. I'm so excited to be at Massey. Like I feel like there's so much work that we have done and that we're continuing to do. Um, and I think that hope is what is gonna continue to pull us forward, recognizing that it does seem radical at times, but I think that in order for us to really reimagine 
structures and institutions, we need hope because hope is what gives us this radical vision that we then can bring to life. Yeah. Oh, that's so uh, interesting. To, let's bring Lashanti here and ask whether, oh, uh, is a law school, is a law student hopeful? What, what's, your, what's your message or what's your reflection on Black History Month for you as a law student? I am, I am hopeful as well. And I think that the, the future is bright looking forward. Um, just like as Nicole was saying that some of the disparities that exist are, are, are capitalistic due to our capitalistic society. So I think that once we learn more, we're able to kind of work together and make these situation better for all people. So I know that you're uh, looking to have a, a new project with uh, a clinic, a legal clinic for the black community for on business side. So how are you going to reconcile this reflections on the capitalistic nature of, of some of the problems in, in the context of trying to support black businesses? What's the message here? Well, I think one of the keys to equality is business and entrepreneurship. And so this project is essentially trying to bring together law and business to provide the support that Black and other BIPOC um, entrepreneurs need in order to bring forth their ideas and to grow their, their businesses. So essentially, the idea is to set up a clinic that provides legal advice, business consulting advice, and financial resources to really provide that support that these entrepreneurs need to bring forth their ideas and to support their businesses. So in a way it's, you know, ideas in the public, uh, trying to support them and accelerate them a little bit. So that's the, the point. So let's me bring all three fabulous women here. Uh, so Al, you worked in prison and I think you're, I think your work in prison is almost kind of telling us a lot about um, the, the way in which the, the prison system has been really designed to control and, and punish uh, uh, elements of, of Canadian society. Uh, I think you make the link with the, with the past historical views and the way in which uh, the representation over representation of, of racialized minorities insists, and certainly the indigenous, but also the black community. So where are you on your project? What's this radio show that you're having? Uh, yeah, um, both Nicole and Lashante really well identified that the problems that we experience with anti-Black racism are also tied to a capitalist system. And we can also, of course, recognize that our punishment system of policing and prisons is part of that history, which is part of the long history of Black people being property, um, the need to control and discipline Black people which is part of plantation culture, which is continued forward into the modern day. Catherine McKittrick talks about this a lot, right? That, yeah, um, yeah. that plantation cultures are continued in our modern institutions, whether that's banking, whether that's the organization of urban space or whether that's the prison system. Um, so just to clarify, I actually am no longer allowed to go into the prison. And the reason why is I was accused variously of uh, illegally counseling the woman, which meant asking them about their lives in a normal conversational way. Um, and also touching the woman, which included hugging them after workshops. And then there was also a vague accusation that I was a gang member, largely because of my work with black men in the prison system. And I say that to say that this uh, perfectly illustrates something about the institution that is prison, um, that things like human touch become criminalized at the exact same time as women were being raped by a guard inside the very same institution. So while a guard was sexually assaulting and raping women, I was being told that touching the woman or saying things like, you know, how was your day was somehow a, a trespassing act. So we can move from that and say like, what does that tell us about particularly the history, the colonial history of prisons, um, the history of separation of family that exists in residential schools and exists through slavery, um, the kinds of irrational forms of punishment that are treated as though they are normal in our society. Um, so who is targeted for policing as who is outside of this notion of public safety? Um, you know, we were talking about the healthcare system and you know who is not seen as worthy of treatment and it's the same thing who is not worthy of being members of the public and who is not worthy of being safe and so those of us who challenge the policing and punishment system look very much who is always considered outside of the public so queer people black people indigenous people sex workers people living with addictions people who are living without homes um 
people with disabilities. These are always the people that are being considered outside of the public. And this is also who our system punishes, including, of course, nearly half of our prison system federally being indigenous women now. Uh, the fastest growing rate globally being black women of people in prison. And that is certainly tied to everything else that we experience. So um, what I largely experienced going into prisons was um, the irrationality of the punishment system. And then when you engage with it, and it's not just punishing people for crimes at all, even if we accept that as a premise, we also punish people uh, for, for having human contact. We punish people for reading. We punish people for having political thoughts. We punish people for their perceived measure of remorse and obedience. And all of these things show how unsustainable this system is. Um, I'm giving a long answer. So the last thing I'll say is, you know, during COVID, where it became a public health risk to have people inside jails, in my province, mm -hmm. we released 1% of our prisoners. Yeah. And we did so with no increase in public crime. Um, it showed that we didn't need, we don't need to have people in jail. And that when people put in supportive housing at half the cost as it costs to incarcerate them, the outcomes were so much better. But then we had to return people to prison, not because, uh, you know, crime was an issue, but because prisons are about something else. Um, and that something else is identified through this conversation on anti-Black racism, on colonialism, on uh, the policing and discipline of bodies. So that was a really long answer. You shouldn't start me no, on prisons good. or a long answer. <laughs> well, but it's an... So, uh, but I think your work in terms of defining the future could be a reflection that COVID, I mean, that's what we want. Eh? We want COVID to uh, teach enough so that we don't go back to the same old days, but actually learn and experiment. Is that is that something that, that you see uh, more possible now because the combination of the Black Lives Matter movement and COVID will, what would you like to see as the outcome of, of this? I mean, I think it was a very hopeful time for abolitionists um, where we were having mainstream conversations about defunding the police and about prisons. But we've also seen that now it's February and those conversations, where did they go? So there was you know, two months where we were hearing this mainstream news and black people couldn't move without being on the news. And now we're back to not being on the news. And, and you know, those issues being, if they're taken up, often being taken up outside of the realm of the people living with state violence the most. So um, the, the reforms that stick tend to be, let's get more black people on the board of governors at the university, but not let's actually contemplate the colonial or capitalistic relations of the university, right? Um, let's get more black prison guards, but not let's actually think about decarcerating black people. Um, let's, you know, get body cameras but we're not going to actually address the police killing people. So I think it's also a challenging time. It's a hopeful time, mm -hmm. as people have said, but it's only made hopeful by our willingness to go out every day and fight for liberation and not like lose sight of that prize, not get sucked into, um, oh, you know, this is reformist or you're being too extreme or letting our movement be appropriated into um, solely being this kind of neoliberal thing about like banking and corporate boardrooms and not about the actual liberation of black people being evicted and needing tenancy protection, black women who face sexual violence, black people who are in crisis because we don't have access to mental health, black people who have like poor health outcomes during COVID and are blamed for spreading COVID and policed more harshly. And yes, you know, the prison, uh, the entire prison institution, which just magnifies the way that punishment and inequality exists in our society, which COVID also brought forward. So what do you, Nicole, so do you hope that uh, in a way what Ellis is talking is the way in which the, the movement can be sideswapped and, and just ignore, re, you know, reuse or recalibrate it to be much less dramatic and much less transformative? What's the role of young medical students to make sure that this is not forgotten, that the, the, the experience of the last six months is not forgotten. Yeah, I mean, before I'll answer that, I'll just speak to Professor Jones's point about how movements are co-opted. And this definitely stems with and agrees with Martha Luther King Jr.'s statement about the his concern about the white liberal, the idea that the person who comes for us saying that it's too intense, it's too far, you know, let's take baby steps, let's do things slower. But then the idea is that what we're really trying to do is that we're trying to reimagine society. Anti-Black racism is not a phase. It's not just a thing that people express, but rather it is a need for us, our society to function. It was built on it and it thrives on it. So this idea that we really have to reimagine society and that when movements get co-opted, it's because of the fear of radicalization, but radicalization is the only thing we really need. Um, and in terms of the position, what 
a first year medical student, like our role in all of this, I think that a big part of medicine has to be recognizing that physicians definitely do have this position in society where we have a role as healers and advocates for a lot of different people. And I think that it's important that we leverage our position to fight, to fight and argue for these communities and to recognize our own role in sometimes perpetuating anti-Black racism. That's a really big important step in recognizing that medicine is not protected from it. Um, and even though I may be a Black medical student myself, I have a role in ensuring that my education makes space for the stories of people who are often overlooked and dismissed. And I assume that that's pretty much the same thing in law school, which I, I know that the space of the law school, I mean, the law has been used as uh, El has been talking about very much in protecting the status quo, protecting the way things are. What is that the type of discussions? Do you have that type of discussions at the law school and as a first year student? Largely, we don't have those types of conversations. But I, I was fortunate to have um, a couple of professors that really delved into how the law is used um, and how it can perpetuate systemic racism, systemic bias. And so like in tort law, we talked about how if a person of color brought forward a case, their damages would be discounted because their life was seen as less valuable. Or in criminal law, the overrepresentation of Black and Indigenous people in the criminal in the criminal justice system. So when we kind of look at that, we see how the law really does perpetuate these these systemic biases, and it's so important because the law governs many aspects of our lives, from the health sector to the business sector to um, yeah. the prison <laughs> system. The law is everywhere. So if we have systemic racism within the law we're not gonna be able to really make any changes and, and move forward until we start to really critically analyze how the law perpetuates these systems and what we can do to dismantle it. Well, and the law can be used. I mean, I assume you want to use it to transform things a little bit and, and move forward. I, so I, I know that I wanted to ask a questions about Black History Month, you know, the month of February, you know, I, it, it seems, that the focus on one month, I mean, it's it was created by uh, uh, Gerald Ford in the US to try to create a space in the calendar for people to actually pay attention. Uh, is it a double-edged sword? Like, does it, does it kind of say, okay, well, we now that we've done Black History Month, uh, okay, we can move back to something else in March or so. I mean, is there, isn't it something that should be <laughs> throughout the year as opposed to just one month or is that, are we uh, are we beyond that criticism, L? Well, I prefer to talk about African Liberation Month. I think the goal of this month is supposed to be uh, focusing our mind on the struggle that was and the struggle that still is and the struggle to come. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, the importance of understanding Black history isn't a kind of facile celebrating of firsts where we're like, this person was the first Black doctor. This person was the first Black politician. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and we end up in this kind of limited discourse around celebrating who was the first or celebrating the exceptional. Um, I think, and it's not that we shouldn't understand and know these things, it's incredibly important for young people, of course, to be able to see uh, trailblazers in their fields, to know that history, to know that there were people who came before. But if that's all we're doing is looking backwards, I often make this kind of joke that uh, you know, Black History Month is when we celebrate past radicals by whitewashing them while erasing and continuing to like destroy <laughs> current black radicals, right? And yeah. that's a, like a joke, but it's true as well, right? So mm -hmm. the message of African Liberation Month should be to understand our history, to understand the political history of black people, how much we fought in this country and in other places um, mm -hmm. to bring ourselves liberation and then what moves forward from that. Um, people also talk about, for example, celebrating Black August, which is a month of emancipation because so many important events took place in August, including um, the first slave enslaved people to land in Virginia, um, Matt Turner, that uprising, mm -hmm. uh, Jamaican, the riots, that, um, the, the uprisings of the Maroons. Um, there's so many events. So people have also pointed to August as another month that should concentrate our minds on radical black activity. So I'm not against Black History Month, Black Employment Month, as we often call it, but um, <laughs> but it also, you know, I think that we have to question what is its purpose? And is it just mm -hmm. here for us to, you know, have a bit of drumming and everyone eats some food? And they're like, oh, that was so nice. Black people are nice. They make good food. They dance well. There's a nice fashion show. And then we go home. Or is it 
to understand what brought us here and what our responsibility is on this path. And I, I choose the second. For sure. So what what are the, the things that you'd like to see then as we, uh, for the next uh, month uh, in terms of the right message being sent to Canadians? Are they, uh, are they, I mean, there's always this idea of celebration, which is always a good idea, but you know, the, the, the next phase, what should we measure in the next little while? What's, what are your hopes? And then we'll get maybe two questions from the audience. Yes. Also, I want to hear Lashante and Nicole on this question, but um, first of all, I think black people need the space and being understand that we have to organize ourselves. And I think, mm -hmm. um, before we move to the question of what does Black History Month mean to other people, it's what should it mean to us, you know, and a time for us to do the political reading we need to do, to work in our communities, to return into spaces with each other, to intergenerationally organize, which we're so often blocked from doing, talking to our elders, making sure we're reaching to youth. And you get these beautiful moments in Black History Month where you like, not so much this year, yeah. but you know, you the room for the gala and you see every Black <laughs> community that you haven't seen. And there's a value in that, but it has to yeah. be an organized space for us. And then what we bring outwards to people, um, so if you're, you know, not black, what you should be doing this month, I mean, I do the reading, you know, I believe, that, you know, there's so much out there, I mean, so many great black books, take the time to, to reflect on that, take the time to, to see what black people are saying, to read black writing, to, to listen to black uh, people talking, to uncover histories of people in your communities, particularly, I would say the histories of black women that have been so forgotten and erased, and it has to be active. What does that mean for you? What commitment should you have? Um, if you were advocating for defund the police in July and you've kind of stopped now, maybe it's a good time to go and write a letter to your counselor because Black History Month is going to remind you that this is still active. Um, maybe it's a good time to give some more money to those funds that you were giving in June, but haven't given now. So I think it's, it's everything is about commitment. What is our commitment when we wake up in the morning towards liberation? What do we do throughout the day to bring that? and how do we live out our responsibilities to each other? So I call upon everybody to ask mm -hmm. those questions to themselves. And I wanna hear from Nicole and Lashante. Yes, yes, let's, uh, let's hear from, from Nicole. So what does it mean, Black History Month for you? Oh, I think for me, Black History Month finally means seeing myself or, and experiencing my blackness out of the confinement of whiteness. So not seeing myself as, you know, a, like a black girl, but seeing myself that this is a part of my persona, my personality and my experiences and recognizing the beauty of that. Um, in terms of what people can do for Black History Month, I think that we also have to move past the satisfaction that we get from representation. Um, this idea that if there is a black person on the board, if there is a black person on the, in the space, if there are, you know, enough black medical students, enough black law students, we have done our job and we have done enough. And I think that in a lot of ways that is not sufficient and that we have to consider what are the experiences of these people in these spaces. It's not just about representation, but we want people to be in places where they are valued and accepted and they are not just there for the face of whatever company or institution. Um, and I think that's really important. I think especially as a student where the current Black Lives Matter movement definitely highlighted a lot of institutions and told them that they had to do a better job with representing and including minority students. I think that for you to bring in minority students into your academic institutions without offering them the supports that they need to be successful and thrive in these spaces is a violent decision. And that's what it is, it's violence. So what do we do to ensure that when we bring people into spaces, we make sure that these remain safe and acceptable spaces for them and spaces where they can thrive rather than us to just bring people in unsupported to say that we have the stats to prove that we aren't racist. Well, it's a very wise word in, indeed. I think there's also the idea of um, you need a, a group of support uh, to continue for the actions to continue over time, otherwise it's just a revolving door and, and no institutions get transformed. Lashanti, what about you? What does it mean to you? For, me what, for me, what I would like to see moving forward, uh, not just with Black History Month, but even beyond Black History Month, is for us as a community to start to come together and actually start to develop a plan of how we can dismantle these systems of oppression. Because I think right now it's clear that, you know, that everyone, we, we do want liberation and we do want freedom and equality, but I don't think we really know what that looks like. 
And I think we're so caught up on the fear of the unknown. So I think I, what I'd like to see is to us, for us to come together and start developing those plans and start developing those actions to say, what would this look like? And I think that will help with situations where we see when there's band-aids putting on the problem and we can say, no, that's not enough. So when corporations come out with their statements of anti-Black racism, we can say, no, that's not enough. This isn't the actual solution. So I think holding ourselves and, each, and society accountable and actually developing that plan that we can actually work with and that can actually make change instead of just putting a Band-Aid on it. And then a year from now and five years from now, we're back in the same exact place. Yes, let's. I want to move to the role of art. I know that I'm talking to a law student and then a medical student, but uh, uh, Yunam, you chose the, the spoken word as being the place of action. Uh, and we know that people are moved by art. I mean, that, that changes societies. It gives us new ideas. It opens doors. It opens uh, a, a sense of the other and, and want us to celebrate. Is that... Did you choose to do that? Or did, did poetry choose you or did you choose poetry? <laughs> oh, poetry chose me, definitely. Um, <laughs> to the point that I literally woke up with this spoken word piece in my head, didn't know what it was, wrote it down, and then was like, what is this? It looks like, like no one had ever taught me spoken word. So I didn't know what it was. And then it was only that I saw Keisha Monique in the street and she was like, how come you never come out to poetry night? And I was like, just wrote this thing, <laughs> saw you in the street. Poetry night is the next day. So it really was um, some kind of gift from the poetry gods or ancestors towards me. Um, when I think about art, I always go back to what Tony Cade Bambara says, which is the responsibility of an artist representing an oppressed community is to make revolution seem irresistible. Um, du Bois says, I don't give a damn for any art that is not also propaganda. Um, so this is the recognition of um, art is political within the Black community because speaking and having a voice is political. Black people having presence is political. And when I stand on the stage as a Black woman, um, my mother could not stand on that stage. My grandmother certainly could not stand on that stage. <laughs> you know, threat of, my grandfather was literally threatened with sedition for the words that he sang as a Calypso artist in Trinidad. So um, like we recognize that it's not, Art isn't something that's that's put away in a drawer. It's part of our lives, it's part of expression, and it's, it's extremely political for Black people still to tell whatever stories those are, to testify to our conditions and experiences, to just be unashamed to be, and just to be willing to talk about Black topics, which is still seen as controversial in these particular ways, which goes back to what I said about, you know, not doing real journalism, or you're not a real artist, or you're not, you know, a real prof because you don't do these things in this particular way. And we're still fighting um, to decolonize our voices and to decolonize art and publishing and all these places. Um, so I always think that, you know, art in whatever form that is, and that's just not spoken word, it's in our creative expressions of being as black people, whether that's through dance, how we dress, how we walk, how we move, um, the look on our face when we're in a room, these are all forms of expression and they politically have meaning. And I, I, that's for me um, where, I think art lives so intensely. And that doesn't mean other kinds of art can't do different things. But for me, um, art is this place of testimony and witness, this place of survival, this place of resilience, of meeting each other. Um, you know, when I'm telling the story of people who are incarcerated, I've read those stories to them first. You know, it, it's a shared collective endeavor that we're, how are we going to fight the system? How are we going to bring that forward? And art is one medium for that. So. Um, but I think we also, as Black people, have to challenge the idea that there's a narrow vision of art because um, yeah. Black people cooking and how we do hair, all these things are art as well, right? So we don't want to, to bow down to this kind of Euro idea of what valid forms of expression are. Yeah. I think it's really important that when we talk about self-expression and artist expression as Black people, we run the whole range of that. So does that inspire you to new ideas, Nicole, and in terms of uh, your own expression? <laughs> Oh no, for sure. Like I think that um, definitely with the idea that we also have to be active in our own decolonization, right? That the idea that we also have to participate in ensuring that we check our ideals of what is meaningful and valuable and powerful. So I think for sure, like art has been a big part of my life since I was younger, um, whether it be music, whether it be hair, whether it be cooking, like you grow up with it. When you mention, you know, the way black people just look at each other in a room, there's just a look, you know, or like, <laughs> the way when something happens, you just find someone and you just you can just communicate with your eyes. And those are all important factors that I think we're so quick to dismiss because 
they don't seem valuable in other spaces, but what is important to us is important to us and therefore mm -hmm. it is important, so. Good, I, what about you, Lashante? And you can bring in sports since you, you, uh, you were involved in sports in a really deep way. Is that a place uh, where there's some work to do in sports? Um, I think there there is some work to do in sports, but in general, I think that what art and sports and things like that can really bring is really a place to kind of change the narrative of what it means to be Black. I think a lot of the times we try to pinpoint and say, this is what it means, but I think it's really a place to expand that definition and notice that it's not just one thing. Like there's mm -hmm. many different types of people who enjoy many different types of things. And when we explore that through art or sport, we're really able to see that being Black isn't one thing. It, it's a collective group of people. Well, let's talk about the diversity then, uh, the, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, Al, you mentioned, you know, the intersectionality, the difference between men and women and uh, the way in which uh, queer uh, may have experienced. And I think one of the theme that we've talked about uh, here at, in the, at Massey sometimes is the way in which we want to see this, um, intersectionality well understood and well captured and 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 be be part of it and and be be acknowledged in in deep way so i'm in, in my own uh uh life because i was in politics and next week we're going to talk about being black in politics and what that means the the diversity in in, in within the black communities was also present you know uh, partly because i'm francophone the, the the francophone black community did not speak as much to the anglophone black community which is no surprise since it's constructed this way but is there diversity within the black community that that uh needs to find an expression or is it you know the this the feeling of of community now is so important there's so much unity that there's no that, that this diversity as 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 a, you know, has to take second step or something? Am I misunderstanding or maybe I'm not expressing it well? No, it's a really interesting question. Um, black women have long experienced, of course, the idea that, you know, when it's time to talk about things like sexual violence, we have to be careful about that because that would indict black men. And we understand, mm -hmm. of course, that in a white supremacist yeah. world, black men are, and our communities yeah. are seen different. So black women have always been in this position of negotiating. Um, how do we deal with violence in our communities without, um, creating white supremacist narratives around black violence. And these are things that yeah. we are working out through things like transformative justice, you know, but there's mm -hmm. also a particular pressure on black people to be unified in ways that are unrealistic. So if uh, like two black women are having a dispute, people immediately <laughs> jump to the place of like, this is somehow illegitimate. Like you guys are just black women, can you get along? And say, like, but this year, white people have disputes in public all the time. It's called elections. Like what are elections, but like white people having a giant fight every four or five years out of a political <laughs> Right. But if black people try to say, well, you know, I disagree with you on this, it becomes this idea that somehow that's illegitimate. Right. We have a media that only calls upon us when it's a so-called black story. So, you know, we were all in the media when Trudeau wore blackface and you didn't see us again until like May, you know, <laughs> and then they're like, oh, black lives matter. And then now you don't see us again because there's this idea that we couldn't possibly have anything to say on the economy or child care mm -hmm. or our trade relations with China or whatever. Like we're, that's not a black issue. Right. We're only mm -hmm imagined as right. having something when it's about race and then people are like all i ever see you do is talk about race i'm like that's because you don't ask me about my thoughts on ballet or my thoughts on uh, you know cell phones or something like you're only asking me for my thoughts on race and then you condemn us for having thoughts on race right so yeah. um i think that yes i think there's very little understanding very little tolerance in the white community for actually paying attention to black people long enough to understand what it is we're saying anyway so then there's only room for like one black person at a time. And like this person is the black person that's like in the media, these three black people and then nobody else, right? Um, and so, yeah, I don't think we are ever allowed to live out um, the fullness of conflict with each other, the fullness of disagreement, the complexities of blackness. Um, certainly we're not allowed to have political positions that are different. Um, we're, we're always imagined as part of this monolith and that's put placed mm -hmm. upon us and then we try to find ways to negotiate it. But um, again, not caused by us, caused by these pressures outside our community that our communities are trying to survive with. 
And so if what I about you, Nicole? Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, just like the idea that also with this creation of a monolith, it causes and encourages Black people to deny certain parts of themselves. So the idea that particularly when you come into Canadian society or North American society, you adopt the Black ideals, the Black decisions, the Black, you know, you prefer only Black type of music, you only participate in what we consider to be Black activities. Um, and people come with a, a wide diversity of different experiences that they can't engage with because they don't abide by this agenda that was never created by us. So the idea that, you know, me being a first generation immigrant, not knowing that my Ghanaian side isn't really like part of this black identity that I must adopt these Canadian ideals and whatever they may seem or whatever they may look like. So it's really important that a big part of black liberation is giving black people the opportunity to, to love what they love, right? And have the agency to say, you know what? I like this, I am going to invest in this. And not that we don't even sometimes have the agency to care about what we care about. It's all a part of this agenda of you have to partake with what the Black community cares about, which is not even decided by the Black community. And that's really mm -hmm. important to acknowledge. What about you, Lashanti? Any thoughts on this essentialism, essentialism that, that, is, uh, that can be foisted upon you? Yeah, I think just to add on, there is this sort of view that, you know, if a Black person is speaking, they're speaking for the entire race. So <laughs> it's, it's that added pressure that, you know, you have want to be careful for what you say, because it might not just be my words, it's going to mm -hmm. reflect the whole race, and that might lo not look good. But I think it's just like recognizing that we're humans too, and all that that entails. <laughs> Like we have opinions and ideas, we feel happy, we feel angry, right? Like we're entire beings and mm -hmm. all of that doesn't reflect everyone else. Yeah. So this, so there's lots to be, you know, discussed about this, this idea about how do, uh, how do we create that space uh, for it to be a welcoming space, a, 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 a space of, of expression, of differences? Of uh, is is there some ways in which you have some advice about this? You know what uh, uh, what what would you suggest? What would you, would you like us to do, like Massey to do for the next the rest of the month and the rest of the year? <laughs> I defer to the Massey students on this one. <laughs> well, Nicole, you're on the Anti-Black Racism Council of Massey, so uh, we've been working on this for a while. But uh, what's the any any uh, things that you know are important to you in that agenda? Yeah, I'm definitely going to take this moment to plug the newly <laughs> starting. Um, Black Junior Fellow Network, um, which is the idea that through Massey, we want to acknowledge that Massey does have a Black history. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. I think oftentimes when we talk about different spaces, we start off by saying things like, oh, we want to make the spaces a lot more diverse. or We want to bring in some Black people, but Black people have always yeah. been here. So with Massey has a great history of Black senior fellows, former junior fellows. We have alumnas who have gone through this experience who have so much to give. And I think that's really important that we connect current junior fellows to these spaces so they know that they're not starting Massey's Black History, but they're rather they're just continuing it and that they're supported in their endeavors. That's really important. Um, when I was referring to the idea of that, we're not bringing Black students into spaces and leaving them unsupported. So I think through this network, we create a kind of like a little web where they feel connected and they know that you know we're holding them up we encourage them and we are we, we want them to be and to become whatever they want for themselves and we do encourage their endeavors and when they have these experiences there are other people who have gone through them as well and knowing that through community they can feel that even in a space like Massey. Hopefully in a space like Massey. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> what about uh, Lashanti? Any, uh, any thoughts on uh, pursuing the work here at Massey? I think just one thing to keep in mind is that yes, I'm black, but that's not all that I am. And I think sometimes we get so caught up in seeing someone and we look at them and say, oh, you're black. Yes, but there's other parts of me as well. <laughs> like it, it doesn't stop at that. So I'd say just that's what I'd like yeah. to see, just remembering that there's more to me. 
Yes, you're a law student. Yes, go ahead. Um, I guess the elephant in the room here is um, obviously this summer, what happened with Massey and the questions that were asked around mm -hmm. the appointing of fellows, um, and particularly the resignation of one of the um, senior fellows as a mm -hmm. result of that. And what that really showed us is how often Black women in particular responsibilize themselves mm -hmm. and take responsibility for things far beyond them. So you have a yeah. Black woman being like, I need to resign because of this decision because I feel like I failed my Black community and not, you know, I don't know, considering this application strongly enough or not paying, like as if this Black woman's supposed to be able to pay attention to everything in the world as well as having to be a Black prof as well as doing all of this. But um, I think what that really showed is how often Black people just take um, this responsibility for forming spaces and the, moving the entire weight of racism, you know, like somehow we're here as one and we, we're now responsible for all of that. And I think it's really, really important that we understand that um, that we cannot be responsible for shifting white supremacy. That lies with the institutions. Um, it lies with the people who have actual power in these spaces. And, to, you know, that we have to continually come in and be, yeah, the black law student, the black med student. We both have to do perform blackness in that space and then get condemned for performing black. You know, it's like you black people only care about doing black things, but also why aren't you doing black things for us? You know, so I think it's really important that, you know, we, we recognize um, that our presence, no matter how hard we work, is not going to shift institutional racism. You know, no matter how much we represent ourselves, no matter how good we are, whatever it is that we do, it's, it was never a deficiency in us in the first place. And so it cannot be our responsibility to correct those things. It has to be the responsibility of people yep. in power to, to, to take those steps and, and really understand, yeah, that we, you know, we don't want inclusion on someone else's term. I'm not interested at this point in my life in you know, like, oh, well, what do I have to do to be included in this space? I'll go make my own space then, unless your space is is like, or I'll engage in your space on my terms because I have to pay my bills and maybe you include, but you know what I mean? Like, we're not necessarily like going to invest our entire being into institutions that are not for us, by us, or, or speaking to us. So institutions also have to realize what they've got from us and, uh, you know, that we're not this addendum. We're not this like late stage, like addition. We don't have to be grateful for being where we are, whether that's as like, immigrants or as people in institutions. We're not tokens. We're not only here because of affirmative action. You know, we are making contributions on our own terms. So I think those are just important things to, for people to remember about this position. For sure. And what's, so we're getting to the, the end of our hour here. So what, what would you like the community to remember from this dialogue? What's the, the key message that you would want it to, uh, to, to sink in, you know, uh, Lassange, let's, let's start with you, Lassange. I think the important thing to remember is that Black people are human beings in everything that that means. And just changing that narrative of what it means to be Black and what our contribution is and what our capabilities are, what our potential is, I think that's the key thing to remember. Thank you. So what about you, Nicole? Yeah, um, personally, I definitely harp on the notion that this is not just individual actions. This is rather an institutional problem and recognizing the ways we have to hold the spaces that we operate in and the spaces that may be working for you, how they may not be working for someone else, accountable mm -hmm. for their failures to do so. And when you see those gaps, you're supposed to jump in. And definitely moving from putting the burden on Black people in these spaces in addition to everything else that they may be experiencing to fix these spaces for you. Um, I think that's really problematic. So I think that moving forward, it's really important that we, in, in recognizing that anti-Black racism is not an individual concern, but rather it's how we've built our society. What can we do to uproot it? And in order to uproot it, it has to be radical. And I think that's a big part is that this cannot be a moderate or you know pleasant undertaking, but rather a radical extremist one in a lot of ways, just because the ideas that we are trying to propel and include are really dynamic. And I think that a lot of times people say that, well, you know, that's not possible. But I think that there are a lot of people, a lot of my ancestors who would look at me and say that what I am living, what I am experiencing is a dream to them. And it is possible because so many people made it possible for me. Nice words. What about you, El? What are your last words to our community here? Um, I always believe that everybody has a capacity and a responsibility for liberation and justice. We all 
live that out. And we all can, in the words of Langston Hughes, let down our bucket where we are, right? Um, mm -hmm. That we have to do this work on an everyday basis. Um, that the beautiful imaginings of our ancestors, right? Um, who, when freedom did not exist, imagined freedom for us and gave mm -hmm. birth, uh, did not throw themselves off cliffs, did not um, jump over the board of the ship because they believed that something would come from that. And we are the descendants of that belief and that faith and that imagination. Um, and I believe that that in, imbues in all of us a responsibility. So for black people, we have a responsibility to build our own capacity for liberation, to make sure everything we carry and learn in an institution comes out into our communities in some way, um, that we should be taking the time to educate, taking the time to give people access to the readings, give people access to whatever, you know, we, we gain from institutional knowledge has meaning when we're able to give it to the rest of our community. And then for everybody else, the question is, you know what, in my position where I'm standing right now, what is it that I can do um, to bring mm -hmm. about a more just society, to bring about equality? And I believe everyone has that. We can't have any kind of, um, you know, new imagined space that doesn't involve everybody believing that they have agency and everyone believing that this is a task for us all. So, um, that's what I, I guess I always want to leave people with is that we, we do have the power to win. We have done it. We've seen people come together and, you know, win against amazing odds, win cases, win changes, you know, and, and that's not old history. That's stuff that we, we are part of making now. So um, people need to really ask themselves, what is the commitment to this world? And then really think about what it means to, to take action on that collectively. And uh, everything the student said was so beautiful about that. Um, our humanity and, and you know our belief in a radical future and i just second all of that and it's so amazing yeah. to see him speak you know i'm just so honored to be on a panel with these students wonderful women the well all three wonderful women that that you know that are about transformation and the possibility of justice and and i think uh, that's what we want um so i just want to thank you so much for uh participating in this uh discussions about the, such an important subject, but also about inspiring us to do to do more and to do better and to continue to uh, to study and listen. And and I I hope that uh, we will all be at Massey at some point together to celebrate with food, celebrate with uh, all the great things that you're continuing to do uh, in, in each of your own communities. So merci beaucoup, thank you so much and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.